in high school, and I, I, you go from the, the elementary and the middle schools, and you walk into high school, and you don't know what certain people or certain friends' classes they have, and it comes to that lunch period, and you walk into lunch for the first time, and you've got your tray, and you've got your food, and then you've got to go sit at a table. And it's the dreaded feeling of walking down saying, am I going to be able to sit at this table? Will I be rejected or not? You've got this inferiority complex, or at least I did. I was this little kid, little four foot eleven freshman in high school, and I had no idea who was going to accept me at their table. I didn't know if I was in with them, if I was in the cool crowd. I was at the right lunch table. Fast forward to some years, and I'm working at a festival in which I, the back of my door empties out onto this massive compound where all of these very large band names, people who would know, and thousands are coming to see, and we have these, this compound surrounded, and the only way in which you can get into the compound was if you had an all-access pass or a backstage pass. And so we had various volunteers who would be around that compound, and you could not enter that compound unless you had that pass. Now, there would be plenty of times where the band's entourage, they'd be called locally, hey, do you mind if I come see you? It'd be cool to see you backstage. Let me get there. And so they would come with their family and their friends, and they'd bring like 15 other people, and they'd walk up and say, I know so-and-so. And at that point, our volunteers would say, oh, okay, well, you know this group, then come on in. No, they would actually stop them. They would ask them a couple questions. And they would give every answer under the sun of why that they think they should be let in and go into that compound so that they could go and sit backstage and be with that special, famous artist. It was to the point at one time, I remember in the late 90s, if you remember the the band Jars of Clay. They had a big album. They started with Flood, I think it was. They moved on to some other albums, all of which I forget at this point. Um, but this one gentleman came and was so, so thought he was impressive that he came completely dressed to the nines in a fiddler's outfit. If you remember, the violins and the fiddles were pretty big in some of their albums, and he came completely dressed, and he stood there for two hours saying, if they heard my album, they would want me to play live on stage. I know they'll let me in. No, we did not let him in. It was quite funny, and I would go back into our offices and laugh quite a bit. But it was quite, quite funny that the people who thought they should be on the inside in realistic uh, terms and realistic observations were actually on the outside. But there's something that they came to, at least in their minds, that they said, you know what, I deserve to be, or I think I should be, because of my relationship, should be on the inside. Well, last week, Pastor Aaron posited the question to us if... Jesus were to come into our local area, right? Whose house would we bring him to? Or maybe who are the people in our minds that we would say, you know, I think that you should go to these people's houses. Are they the, the elders? Are they the uh, missionaries? Are they the really humble in spirit? Are they the people with a large fancy house so more people could fit in and be with Jesus? Jesus made it clear that he was there for the sick. He was there for those who realized in their hearts and they were spiritually in decay. And Christ came for those who were looking for a Messiah, who were looking for healing on the inside. And that's who Jesus came to see. That is the gospel that he wanted to preach from town to town. And with comparable ignorance, many thought that they were or should be part of or associated with Christ as we move on from that passage. From the multitudes that followed him to his family... To the elite from Jerusalem, each supposed that they had the right to presume upon his mission. But as we'll see in chapter 3, it was Christ alone who would show them who his true disciples were to further his gospel mission and to establish a new kingdom. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through all the passages and then I'm going to take a step back and kind of reflect on kind of a 20,000, 30,000 foot understanding of this passage of what it kind of points to. But we're going to go through the nuts and bolts of this passage. Starting in, again, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. And a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and and Udumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. Right away that we see that the crowd was, was quite large, and they actually had covered, from a geographic standpoint, a very large swath. It was just a huge area. Some come from about 120 miles south of where he was. And what you have represented here, the picture that's being painted, is not only do you have Jews that are here, 
from Galilee, but you have those who are in primarily Gentile regions. And then you have other regions that have kind of a mix of both Jews and Gentiles. And what we're seeing is that the spread or the influence that Jesus had, His healing ministry, His exorcisms, the word that was going out, how he preached in power, as we learned about in verse one, in chapter one, excuse me, is actually reaching far beyond what John the Baptist's reach was. And so his influence and the spread is geographically going. And so now all of these people are hearing this, and now they're pushing in on him. And if you think about a circle and drawing it around that area of where Jesus was, this is a large amount of people. And so just in these two verses, we can't like just kind of brush past those. Those are people traveling from 120 miles and they did not have the turnpike. Like not everybody had a chariot. They were like walking. And maybe you're saying, amen, I'm glad they didn't have the turnpike. But the reality is that they're coming from far to see who this Jesus is. In verse 9, it goes on and says, And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. The picture is this. We see Jesus retreating again with his disciples as he often does after a confrontation with the Pharisees, as Pastor Aaron went through. And this large crowd from all over had pressed around him. Now, as we think about that, they had pressed around him. The verb there is to throw oneself upon. This is not just kind of snuggling up to Jesus, kind of cozying up. Hey, Jesus, I, I want to know a little bit more about you. Can, you. can you speak into this situation? Can you heal this wound of mine? Can you... Speak to me about this whole mess Messiah stuff. No, they were forcibly pressing in on Jesus. This was not some um, casual walking to and crowds were following him and just giving him his space. No, these are crowds that are literally pressing in on him. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where that has happened. Maybe you've been overseas. I know that I've taken and been with many different missions teams in many different countries, often they were third world, and what happens is when they see that you have something they want, whether it's money or they just want to come see the white person with the white skin, um, or with the blue eyes, or the tall person, or the short person, and they want to press in on you, it can at times actually be kind of scary, kind of dangerous. And at one point, and what probably was happening here is that when you thought you had control of you, in reality, the, cro the crowd was the one who basically had control. And you lose your own individual control, and it becomes a swarm. I'd watch this at concerts time and time again when the kids would crowd around the music that basically got them excited, and they were jumping up and down, and they were ramming into each other. At one point or another, they lost control, and we would have so many injuries and black eyes and knockouts and broken this and broken that. And this was at a Christian festival. So um, you can imagine here the scenario that's being painted. It isn't that everybody's falling in line and they're in order. Jesus was being pressed in upon. And that's the picture. Now surely this crowd was coming to Jesus, but as verse 10 points out, their focus was on their own healing. Their heart motivation did not get past the physical. James Edward notes, he goes, the crowd is a paradox. It needs, uh, its needs command Jesus' attention, and Jesus is fully attentive to the, the misery present in its numbers, but its clamor is not a response of faith. Oh, they're pressing in on Jesus. Oh, they want to see Jesus, that, but primarily, primarily it's not their heart that's driving them there. It's the external. It's these physical needs. What have you done for me lately, Jesus? Well, let's see. And they press in from all around. And who knows what the rumors were about him? Who knows how the word spread and what that sounded like to others? But they were pressing in. And in verses 11 and 12, Mark ends this short section noting the demons falling down before Jesus when they saw him and crying out that he is the Son of God. Yet Jesus commanded them not to make that fact known. This may seem strange, as that was truly Jesus' identity, but we have to remember that not only was there a timing to all that Jesus was to accomplish, but there was a way in which Christ's name was to be made known. 
He was saying to the demons, hush, you be quiet now. There's a way in which I will spread my name and make it known, and it will not be through you. And so I command you to hush, to be silent. It doesn't make sense to us in some ways as we read this. He's making known. Wouldn't that verify your ministry, Jesus? Oh, there are many things that people understood in the life of Jesus, but there was a particular way and and through whom particular people would make his name known. Jesus had a plan, and this was all in line with it. And casting out demons was was a part of it, but the way in which his name would be made known would be through the vessels that he would call to himself, which brings us to the next verses. Verses 13 through 21. I'll start with just 13 through 19, and it says this, And he went up on a mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and might send them to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. He appointed, or made, the twelve. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealots, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. In this passage here, we see that the picture is intentionally similar to when Moses and the leaders of the twelve tribes of Israel were called to Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. What's happening here with Mark is he's painting a picture. Jesus goes up onto a mountain, and then he calls his disciples to him, right? And they respond, and they come to him. And this imagery is very comparable, very similar to when Moses was up on the mountain, and he called to him who? The leaders of the 12 tribes, right? He called Moses, and then there was Aaron, and there was his two sons, and then there were the leaders of the 12 tribes. And he called all of them to them. And I'm going to read some of that for you. You don't have to turn there if you, if you want to. It's on page 64 and 65. But in Exodus 24, verses 1 through 11, he says, Then he said to Moses, Come up uh, to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall, come not, shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. But Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And moves on. It says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it and the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And moves on. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel, They beheld God and ate and drank. This imagery of Jesus now calling up to himself uh, the 12 disciples should evoke this imagery of Moses when he was establishing the people of God. Remember, he gave Moses the Ten Commandments, and out of that, they were to understand what it meant to worship God and what it meant to be holy and set apart as a people unto God. Why? So that they could be a testimony to the nations around them that we are the people of God. Now, as we all know, that didn't happen necessarily well. They went out into the lands, and what did they do? They conformed to the nations around them. And so eventually, that's why we're getting to this point where Jesus is coming down because God sends his son, and he says, now I'm establishing my kingdom. And it's going to start with these 12. And you 12, I'll come up onto the mountain, I will call you, I will tell you what the good news is, I will conform you to my image, and I will send you out so that you can now be a new people to the nations, both Jew and Gentile. And so he's establishing his kingdom. He's establishing his people so that they will be a light to the nations. He's conforming a people of his own, and it starts with these 12. So Jesus is calling to him those he desired in verse 13, which And the Greek is a little bit more emphatic as Edwards notes. He says, the sense is that he summoned those that he willed. Jesus determines the call. 
Caravilla would make the note that the making of disciples in any generation is a momentous and authoritative appointment by Jesus. In essence, Jesus calls them so that they could be with him, and through them, Jesus would establish what his new kingdom people would look like. This is a pretty cool moment, historically speaking. And moving on into verses 20 through 35, we come to two different groups that approach Jesus now that he's gone back to his home, or to what is now his home base in Capernaum. Now they approach him in order to oppose him, these two different groups. And as we read these accounts, Mark uses this literary technique, which scholars have dubbed the sandwiching, or a Markin sandwich, they might call it, in which he takes one story, he kind of splits it into two, and then he puts... Another story kind of in the middle of that, and we'll see that as we walk through Mark. We'll see that various times, and we'll probably kind of bring your attention to that. But in this particular passage, uh, the two outsides of this sandwich, if you will, are verses 20 and 21, real short, and then it continues in verses 31 through 35, leaving the inner verses of verses 22 through 28 as the kind of the meat of the sandwich. Yet these two stories also relate, so be keeping this in mind as we kind of walk through this, as we progress through this. The first opposition comes from family. Verses 20 and 21 says this, Then he went home, this is after naming his disciples, Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family, or I think the only other translation I was reading, I read from about five different translations, the New American Standard has here, and when his own people, I don't know if any of you have that and you're working from the NAS, um, that's translated in essence kinsmen or same blood relations. Most other people now translate this as his family. So, and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. So Jesus returns home, and yet again, this crowd is gathering. This crowd is pushing in on him so that they couldn't even eat. The understanding of his kingdom come is not necessarily shared by those close to him, not by his family, it would seem. This should be obvious as they thought that he was out of his mind in verse 21, or even berserk, as one commentator translated it. So much so that they wanted to seize him. Now, another word for this, because wordplay will be going on into the middle part of this uh, message here. Another word for seizing him is binding him. So the understanding that we're supposed to get that they they wanted to grab him, they wanted to bind him, and they wanted to take him away because of how he was acting and or what he was saying. Nevertheless, clearly his family was worried for him and probably their own reputation. So even those close to him aren't on the same page. Just because one is family does not mean that one is following in faith. Keep this in mind as we get to the other side of verse 30. So now we come to the meat of the sandwich in verses 22 and 30, where we see this second opposition as they approach the house. Verse 22, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house." It starts off by saying, the scribes come, where? From Jerusalem. If anyone would be able to name drop, it would be the scribes. These in particular carried authority, not just by being scribes, but by being scribes from Jerusalem. That's where the temple was, after all. They carried with them a bit of clout. They too wanted to approach Jesus at his home to oppose him by accusing him of casting out demons by the power of demons, or more precisely, Beelzebul, which by Jesus' response is clearly a nickname for, for Satan. Jesus, in turn, just points out their flawed logic. It's simple. He says, if a house is divided against itself, there is no possible way that it would stand. You would think that this would be obvious, but not for spiritually blind scribe. I think that we see this even in our own homes. When things get a little crazy in our own homes and there's inner conflict, it looks like our house is falling apart. 
You've heard the comical way of saying that when uh, spring comes and the windows open, you've got to realize that your windows are now open so that the way in which you engage your children and the way in which the children engage their parents uh, should change. I don't typically yell like this all the time, in other words. Make sure you're quiet, the neighbors will hear, because it would sound like our house is falling apart. This is obvious. Then he makes the statement that, quote, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Well, Jesus' point here is that one stronger than the strong man has come, and the proof is in the pudding. The exorcisms speak for themselves. Satan cannot compete with the power of Jesus' coming kingdom. I love the way that James uh, Edwards puts it. He says this, and this is so important. He says, "As, as the Son of God, Jesus does something for humanity before doing something to it. He must liberate humanity from the power of evil by restoring it to the image of God. He first removes the barrier by which we were enslaved, our sin, the captives, the, the dark forces of this world. He says, I am stronger than the strong man that binds, and now I will plunder the goods. And so Jesus is saying, nothing can compete with me, the strong man. And then Jesus closes with verses 28 through 30. And these verses probably ring true, at least through those uh, in their teenage years, and even maybe so right now with some of you. These are very familiar because we've used these words and questioned some things in our own lives. He says this, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, one of the keys to understanding Jesus' response regarding blaspheming the Holy Spirit is to understanding a primary role of the Holy Spirit. In John 15, 26, another gospel, Jesus says that when the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father and Son, he will bear witness about Jesus. John 15, 26 says this, but when the Helper comes, the Helper being the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. This is one of the primary roles or jobs of the Holy Spirit, to bear witness about who Christ is. So in essence, when you continually deny the Spirit by which Jesus performs the miracles and exorcisms, and you deny the Spirit revealing the fact that Jesus is God, then you are denying the only way in which one can come to the Father. Now note the trajectory starting in verse 28, the first part of Jesus' statement. He says that all sin and blasphemies man commits and utters will be forgiven. This statement, in a joyous and positive way, like this is a positive statement. This is a amen, thank the Lord, hallelujah type statement. Okay, this is joyous and positive. It points our eyes to what Christ would do on the cross. Read that statement slowly. Understand where it's taking our eyes and pointing them toward. He would pay a debt we could not pay. All sins would be forgiven. He would take the wrath of God for all sin which we rightly deserved, whether it be lying, gossiping, murder, gluttony, adultery, homosexuality, pride, envy, even speaking against Jesus himself. And in turn, he would give us his righteousness in order to stand forgiven before the Father. That whole statement, that all sins will be forgiven men, is a foreshadowing of what the cross would provide for each one of us. That we too would be forgiven all of our sin. This is a good thing. Hold your heads high. Don't be ashamed. God has taken that upon himself. And then he says, he says, but this, however, if you continually deny the spirit bearing witness to the only way in which that forgiveness can happen, then you will be eternally separated from God's forgiveness. If you don't realize your need to repent because of your sin, you can't receive forgiveness offered on the cross. If the cross is a stench to you and you don't understand your need for repentance because of it, then that forgiveness is not applied to you. You can't receive it. You can't deny what the Spirit is testifying to and then expect forgiveness when it comes to that day. 
John Piper notes this. He says, the reason these scribes are dangerously close to being guilty of eternal sin is because they are evidencing such a settled hardness of heart. Not just against this mysterious son of man, but now explicitly against the Spirit, that their hearts may no longer be capable of repentance. It's not that they may be genuinely repentant, but given the stiff arm, meaning it's not that they really wanted to repent, but now Jesus is saying, ah, now that you want to do it, no, sorry, it's not going to happen. That's not what he's talking about here. But that they will, ha- they will never have forgiveness because they will never meet the simple, invaluable, soft-hearted condition for it, which is a repentant heart. Repentance. If you were like me, uh, who for so many of my rebellious teenage years thought that after I was introduced to the gospel that, that my, my actions were so grievous, my heart was so, heart, my, my, my heart was so hardened, my care was so lackluster, my inconsistency was so inconsistent, the way in which I spoke, the language which, which I used was not um, parallel with one who honored God. And I kept thinking, Lord, is it too far? Is it too far? Have I said too much? Have I done too many? Take heart and take courage, my friend. Know that if you're thinking those thoughts and there's a conviction in your heart that maybe my heart is not in the right place, it means your heart is still soft enough to understand that you have the need to repent and turn to God. You are not too far. Understand this, that your sin will never outrun the grace of God. His arms are way too wide and His grace is that too much in one sense. It will cover your sin. It will cover your sin. Now to end this entire chapter in these passages, it says this in verses 31 through 35. Remember now we're coming back from a story that was started earlier in verse 20. It says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mothers? Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. As we look at the continuation of a story that was started here in the earlier verses, we see that his family approaches the house. They can't even get to him. As opposed to the unruly crowds that had been pressing in on him, Mark says that this crowd was now sitting around him. So it's kind of two different uses of that word crowd. Now this crowd is designated by those who are now sitting around him. What is being pictured here is more of an academic setting, that they're actually encircling him. That's really what the Greek is talking about. It's sitting around him, and so Jesus is here as the authority, and he's teaching those who are around him. This is the crowd that has come to him as his family approaches the house. But now his family is on the outside looking in, and Jesus is made aware of this fact in verse 32. But seemingly without pause, he asks a rhetorical question. Who are my mother and my brothers? And after what? Looking around at those sitting around him at his feet, he answers his own question by saying, those who do the will of God are his true family. Those who do the will of God are his true family. So what's his point? Again, Jesus is establishing his kingdom. He had chosen his disciples foundationally, and now those who come to Christ cannot come by any means other than faith in who he is if they really want to be a part of his kingdom work. He's saying your family name won't save you. You're not automatically on the in because of familial proximity. Jesus makes it quite clear that if you want to be a true disciple of Christ, that you too must sit at his feet. You cannot get there any other way. In Luke 11, we see Jesus deflect the praise of Mary when a woman shouts out, quote, Blessed is the womb that bore you. And Jesus' reply is what? Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. He didn't suggest that she shouldn't be blessed. If you read the Gospels, clearly she was chosen and she was blessed. Highly favored among all women, right? That's true, but he says, and he deflects the praise, and he says this, that truly blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. For God's 
kingdom, for Christ's kingdom, family is completely redefined. Those who are disciples of Christ are brothers and sisters. They're giving this understanding of family language. There are no shortcuts, and each one of us, if we are to be disciples, sits at the feet of Christ. In this specific case, those who thought they were on the inside found themselves, found themselves at least in the early part of his ministry, sitting on the outside. Now, as true disciples, we are all still, right, sitting at the feet of Jesus. There's no other way that you can become a disciple unless you sit at the feet of Jesus. And that as we look around, even looking around us right now, these are our brothers and our sisters. These are our mothers, our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandchildren. These are people in the family of God. And one of the primary ways that we care for our nuclear family is by discipling them in the context of the broader family of God as he defines it. Through hospitality, through serving together, worshiping together, praying together. This is the true life of the family of God. America may suggest we should keep to ourselves while chasing after autonomous dreams or sports goals, academic pursuits, but the Bible paints a different understanding of how our time should be spent and with whom we should be spending it. All of us benefit when we live life together at the feet of Jesus. So, that's the passage. Now let's take a, a step back here in the last few minutes that I have. And look at it, it's an entirety, and I think that we can see two primary groups of people. Those who are on the outside and those who are on the inside. First, let's go with those who are on the outside. We have his family, and then we have the scribes, right? Who in different ways looked at Jesus' authority with disdain. His family, who were on the inside of his life, thought he was out of his mind. They came to bind him, to take him away, to derail the mission that he was on, constantly preaching to the crowds, healing the sick and casting out demons. At what point is too much, maybe too big of a crowd or too close to home? Is this going to his head? I, I don't know the questions that were swirling around in their minds. That's purely conjecture on my part. But what I do know is this, that, that they were not on the same page and consequently found themselves, though on the inside of his family, on the outside of his mission. And the second group that we have on the outside are the scribes, who were on the inside of the religious tract, though they thought he was possessed. They came to stir the crowd's allegiance away from Jesus, but they were the teachers. They were the ones sitting in the seats of religious power. They were the ones who held the influence Yet just because they were surrounded by all the structures of religious life, they found themselves on the outside when it came to Jesus. Both of these groups are juxtaposed by the true disciples on the inside with Jesus. For the insiders, this is what we have painted here. First, we have the twelve. They were the ones who Jesus stole away with so that they might be with him. Quote is what he says. They were called by Christ, and as verse 13 simply states, they came to him. It says in verse 13, and they went up on the mountain and called to him those he desired, and it just simply states that they came to him. Jesus called, and they simply came. Well, it wasn't anything more than that. It wasn't anything grandiose. It wasn't some huge vision. It wasn't like sparkles that came out. It wasn't like I had this epiphany. It was Jesus called them, and they responded, and they just came. It was as simple as that. Some might suggest that that's an altar call. I don't think so. There wasn't great instrumental music playing in the background. Somebody didn't come with a brick of Scripture and hit them upside the head. Jesus called them, and they responded. It was simple, yet profound, because something changed in their hearts. They responded to His call. They were the ones on the inside with Jesus, and they were empowered and commissioned to do the will of God by preaching the good news and carrying the same message that Christ was proclaiming. Second, we have the crowd who found themselves on the inside of the house with Jesus, encircling him and learning at his feet. They are the ones Jesus noted as mothers and brothers. They too were disciples and part of the true family of God, wanting 
to do his will. As I've said before, have you found yourself at the feet of Jesus through the words of Scripture? No, we don't physically have him here right now. He is intentionally interceding on our behalf at the right hand of God so that when we do call on the Father, it's translated through the Son by the power of the Spirit, and the Father hears us perfectly. That is where he is. But we see Christ illumined from the pages of a living and active word that speaks to our hearts and calls to us. Are we responding to this and are we sitting at the feet of Jesus and the words of Scripture? He still calls to us by His Spirit, empowered through the words. What about us? When we look at our lives as Christians, do we still find ourselves there learning the feet of Jesus, learning from His Word and proclaiming the good news to those around us? Do we think that just because our mom and our dad and our brother and our sister or our mother or our grandparent knows Jesus, that somehow we have the inner track and we are good to go, right? We come from great stock, great lineage. They've attended Shawnee Baptist for 70 generations. It was here before it was even started. Whatever excuses that you might have, we know the right people. We serve in the right places. My family is this, such and such. I now should be close to Jesus, right? I think Jesus points out that it doesn't work that way. Maybe we think that because we've been in and around the church for decades holding various positions of authority and because we've served in this or that ministry for so long that we deserve a place at the table with Christ. The true discipleship is spending time with Christ and being obedient to His Word. We have that revealed to us in the Scriptures. We aren't left to wonder what He's saying to us. We know it. Jesus is calling all of us to discipleship. The only track is sitting at His feet and obeying the words of Christ, modeling what it looks like, being empowered by His Spirit and being sent out with that same gospel proclamation, that same good news that needs to transform our own hearts regardless of who we know so that the world would benefit from it, so that we are part of this kingdom that God is forming, this people, both Jews and Gentiles, who God is fashioning so that He can return and be with Him forever. Are you a disciple? Or do you find yourself on the outside looking in, even though you've been on the inside for so long? God calls to you. He speaks to you. All He wants us to do in turn is respond and come to Him. Sit at His feet. Read of his goodness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that by your spirit and through the person and the work of Christ, you have called each of us to come and to see that you are good. And in turn, we by faith in what Christ has done and his forgiveness on the cross, has made a way so that we too can be disciples. God, change our hearts, mold us and fashion us that we would go out into a world that needs this same message, the same good news, and that they too would respond to your call. In Jesus' name, amen.